Hello friends, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our viewers who have joined from different parts of the world. Welcome to this fifth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. Co-hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, and CNS. This virtual conference features 14 online thematic sessions spread over June to December 2020 with plenary speakers and top ranking abstract presenters sharing their insights around sexual and reproductive health and rights and SDGs in the Asia Pacific regional context. These sessions are also streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. Today's session, which as I have told you, is the fifth in the series, focuses on climate change and sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia and the Pacific. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Noilin Nambulivo, co-founder and political advisor for Diverse Voices and Action for Equality, or DIVA, as it is more commonly known as, an organization based in Fiji that focuses on climate justice, violence against women, human rights, and LGBTQ rights. Noeline is a globally renowned Fijian feminist activist who has been campaigning since the past 35 years for climate justice, sustainable development, and gender equality. She indeed wears many hats. She is a frontline community organizer, praxis-based researcher, and analyst, teacher, facilitator, and advocate in local, regional, and global spaces. Over to you, Noelle. Thank you. Thanks everyone um, for being here with us today. And it's a real pleasure. I can see there's about, there's over 90 people who are with us today and I'm sure others will be joining us via Facebook Live. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, and probably late night um, for some of us. Um, I really wanted to start um, just with a few uh, key remarks and then um, I'll introduce you to, we have an embarrassment of riches here in our uh, presenters today. And then we'll also hopefully at the end have some time for questions and answers. So. Um, let's let's make a start. So I've been um, a feminist activist since I was about 16 years old and um, and now I'm 52. So that's quite a long while. So I work on all issues of you know human rights and social economic and ecological linkages and one of the things I was thinking about um, in terms of this session was that you know even just a decade ago I used to get lots of comments and kind of surprise when um, when I said that I was working both on sexual reproductive health and rights and climate change, trying to show the linkages, um, you know, between those um, areas of work, between disaster risk and response and elimination of violence against women and talking about LGBTQI human rights and sustainable development. But here we are today and I think, you know, we're still, many of us, still having to make those calls and um, linkages clear to people, but also that there's a lot more of us who are looking for the specific, you know, working on these issues together and looking for specific um, tactics and strategies that, that are helpful. So things like an interlinkage frame um, so, uh, so that we can, you know, clarify that the issues aren't um, siloed and that they're across all areas of our society and government. The second is intersectional uh, um, frames that allow us to look at what kinds of people, what kinds of bodies are, inter, you know, interacting um, uh, in terms of uh, sexual reproductive health and rights with all kinds of issues housing water sanitation all sorts of things how do our how do we negotiate power within those identities and so there's a few realities that I just wanted to use to frame this session and the first one um, if we talk first about climate change is that um, we know already you know there are many things that we know now and we know that we're striving for a 1.5 maximum degree global warming world um, in order to be safe and that we know that we're globally and nationally way off that trajectory and to get there now um, means that you know that's a massive call for a civilizational level change um, and that's change to our 
planet to the whole um, ecosphere, but also our societies and at individual levels. And we're in imminent danger of wiping ourselves out and we're already doing it to 150 to 200 other species around the world every day. So the work by and for peoples and you know, with each other is difficult. It's already difficult and the changes that are coming are profound. Um, so we should keep that in our minds while we're we're thinking and acting on this. And the second is that if we keep on the current trajectory um, and the added problems that we're finding with this pandemic and other issues, human rights violations, et cetera, we're in danger of missing every single SDG by 2030 is what the UN is saying now um, at the latest HLPF. So if that's where we're at, that's a, that's a scary reality and, and right now some of the things that we're dealing with is looking at reversing some of the gains that we've been making over decades and i'll talk a little bit about that but it'll really come out from the speakers the third thing we have to kind of maybe reframe and articulate in a different way with each other now is that climate change is a symptom and it's showing up a deeper and a wider damage to the planet um, and so there are social and political and economic practices that must be stopped now we can stop fossil fuel use, we can stop the subsidies for fossil fuel, um, we can stop decimating our commons, you know, our air, our water, our oceans, we can rewild, not just massive plantings of trees, but really looking at our biodiversity and how are we going to make sure that our forests um, aren't in trouble, which they already are. Um, addressing loss and damage in a really real way at an individual and localized level. Um, and then really looking at the indicators. How do we measure um, loss and damage? And, and how do we make those indicators the core ways in which we measure how well we're doing um, this work together on, on all kinds of work including SRHR and climate change and to that latter point if we just look at COVID-19 um, for instance it's a zoonotic um, disease as and it's one of many who jump species because we're devastating all our wild and natural areas and disturbing our ecosystems um, and so those double and triple consequences of COVID-19 of the cyclones for instance we had cyclone Harold in Fiji just weeks after we experienced the the national shutdown um, and the and the longer term ecological damage is all happening at the same time and then the fourth thing is that in the midst of all of this we have to convince people that SRHR is central to a, any development response because the body is where the damage and the trauma and the human rights violations are felt just as we are the vehicles of the change as well so I really just wanted to say that women in the Pacific for instance the fact that we have some of the highest unmet needs of contraception and the fact that we have such high levels of violence against women and the fact that we have such hierarchical um, societies and this this challenge that we have to make to the patriarchal and heteronormative um, um, structures of our society are part of this whole shift that we have to make um, this civilizational change that we talk about women and girls and lgbtqi people are confronted by cyclones lockdown realities um, flooding water salinity intrusion and damage to our food and our water systems a lack of housing um, and a loss of jobs there's over 150,000 jobs um, that that have been lost in Fiji right now. And, and so we're running, for instance, a food program, a school food program, because we're seeing that the hunger is rising rapidly. Um, and also women and children are, are showing um, nutritional um, problems as well already. Um, and we have a 200% increase in GBV in this, this quarter we've just come through in 2020. So I just wanted to say, um, I won't say any more, but to say that this and so much more is the fabric of our discussions today Today. And it's to highlight the issues, but more it's to get to all the strat uh, strategies and tactics um, that, uh, that we have to think about that'll help us to create those systems of safety for everyone, including women, girls at risk and marginalized people. What challenges to, uh, in SRHR are Asia and the Pacific countries facing due to climate change and what strategies are we using? So our speakers uh, are going to speak to that. We have a really rich panel, so I'll introduce all of them at once for time, um, but um, also it'll help you to see the, the session flow. And please to the speakers straight after, if you can um, start your uh, the plenary and first, and then um, all of the speakers' presentations. You have you will have fifty 
excuse me, you will have 15 minutes. So we, be, we will begin with Dr. Adrian Hayes, who's an honorary associate professor um, in the School of Demography at Australia National University. He's a demography and sociologist with um, research interests in population and development and climate change. And today he's really going to concentrate on how is it, you know, giving us a broad picture of how to improve SRHR in an age of climate change and, and, um, and sustainable development and where we are with that. Then we We'll move to Leiloa Asasa, who works with the well-known Samoa Family Health Association. Um, she'll look at the Community Disaster and Climate Risk Management Program in Samoa and addressing SRH and um, how we build stronger local um, Samoan communities. Um, we move then to Dr. Safia Sharia Shariari Ashfa, and I'm sorry, apologies to anyone whose name I'm trying very hard, um, who's a noted obstetrician and gynecologist from Iran. Um, she has a wealth of knowledge and experience from um, the chair of the NGO's working group, a health working group, but also um, the founder and former president of the Family Health Association of Iran and former chair of International Planned Parenthood for South Asia. Um, welcome, doctor. She's going to give us a discussion of humanitarian assistance Assistance and provision of SRH in a flood uh, affected area of Golestan province um, in Iran and, and through the work of a particular um, family health association um, which is in Iran. After that presentation we'll hear from Biplabi um, Shesht Shreshtha, um, who will be discussing the Women and Earth or the Worth Initiative. And that's really trying to raise the bar um, on addressing gender and SRHR um, in the age of climate change. She's from our well-known Arrow um, Network, um, where she manages a program trying to really look at how we build new constituencies for sexual and reproductive health and rights. And one of her key areas of work anyway is on the links between SRHR and climate change. So welcome, Biplabi. Um, from Biplabi, we'll then have a team of three who will uh, co-present and they'll have around five minutes each because it's a um, tri-country study um, from Cambodia, India and Pakistan and it'll be Ashish uh, Bachracharya with two colleagues, um, Dr. Zeba um, Satar and Dr. Uh, Bidushun um, Mahapatra. They will speak on how environmental changes are affecting the health and well-being of vulnerable populations in those um, three countries. Your challenge is even greater as you have 15 minutes to share between you um, and you're the last speaker. So we really call on all of us um, to work together on this. We'll begin with um, Associate Professor uh, Hayes. Um, so how will we do this improvement of sexual and reproductive health and rights response in this time of climate change? Thank you. Thank you, Norlene. It's a privilege to participate in this important meeting and I want to thank the organizers very much for inviting me. I remember attending the association's meetings uh, in Indonesia a few years ago and I was inspired by the level of commitment and enthusiasm of all the participants. Slide two, please. Bobby? Thank you. We live in a time that has been called the age of sustainable development. As Nolene pointed out, climate change may indeed be the most urgent environmental problem facing global society at the moment. But if we want to respond to that, we need to do it in ways that are sustainable and not just add further problems for the future. It goes without saying that we won't achieve the goals of sustainable development unless we resolve the looming crisis of climate change as well. The concerns of climate change and sustainable development, in other words, merge into one another. During the preparation of Agenda 2030 for sustainable development and the sustainable development goals which followed, advocates for sexual and reproductive health and rights worked hard to make sure that SRHR were included. They were not successful in getting a single sustainable development goal for SRHR, but they were successful in getting sexual and reproductive health and rights included among the targets listed under two of the SDGs. Slide three, please. Firstly, uh, SDG three, focusing on good health and well-being, has a target by 2030, ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services, including family planning, information and education, 
and the integration of reproductive health into national strategies and programs, and a target for SDG 5 on gender equality reads ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. Furthermore, the very first target listed under SDG 3 is to reduce maternal mortality. And this is very clearly an important component of SRHR, which many would argue not only contributes to overall good health and well being, but also crucially to gender equality. So the question is what, if anything, does such a perspective on sustainable development have to offer those working on sexual and reproductive health and rights? And conversely, can we make a convincing argument that improving SRHR in the Asia Pacific region does indeed contribute to attaining the SDG goals and resolving anthropologic, anthropogenic climate change? I want to start the discussion by looking at two indicators of the changing status of SRHR in countries throughout the region, namely unmet need for family planning and the maternal mortality ratio. Slide four, please. This slide shows data on unmet need for family planning for eight of the countries of South and Asia. Uh, Unmet need, as you probably know, refers to women of reproductive age or in union who say they do not want any more children or at least do not want to get pregnant in the next year or so, but who nevertheless, together with their partners, are not currently using contraception. These are the women who have an unmet need for family planning. If the global target is to achieve universal access to family planning services, then we might assume that unmet need for family planning should decline to zero. That would be evidence that everyone who had a need for family planning would have that need satisfied. But human life is rarely that cut and dry, of course. From a realistic point of view, it would be more realistic to reduce unmet need or to aim to reduce it to perhaps 10% or below by the year 2030. From estimates provided by the UN Population Division, this target appears to have been reached already by a number of countries and territories in the region, including China, Hong Kong, Iran, New Zealand, Singapore, South Korea, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam. But other countries still have a ways to go. The data, by the way, are model-based. That is to say, the UN have collected and collated the best population survey data available from all countries going back to 1970 and use sophisticated statistical models to fill in the gaps. There's um, a band of uncertainty around the trend, li trend lines, consequently. Um, these data are not intended to give an accurate figure for one point in one time at a particular country, but to give the overall picture of what the trends are and what the scale of the problem might be. The small colored circles refer to the demographic and health surveys and other services that provide the underlying data. On the top row here, look at India, for example, the largest country in Southern Asia. The solid black line shows how the unmet need has changed with time. In 1970, less than uh, a third of about a third of married women in India between the ages of 15 and 49 had an unmet need for family planning. By 1990, the figure was down to 25%, and by today, it is perhaps a little under 20%. The decline, you can see, has been relatively slow and steady since 1970, and the rate of decline itself seems to be slowing a bit. The modeling further suggests that projecting into the future, unless there is a renewed effort to improve family planning services and probably other aspects of SRHR as well, the unmet need will likely still be in the 10 to 20% range in 2030. Close to 10%, but perhaps not below it. Compare the decline in Bangladesh. It started more slowly and later than in India, but it has been steeper than India since the 1990s. We don't have time to discuss all the countries in detail, but you can see how different countries are experiencing different pathways. It's sobering to note that of the six countries shown here with unmet need of 20% or more in 2020, only one, Bangladesh, is expected to reach the 10% threshold by 2030 under current trends. 
let's review um, the other major areas of the region too. Slide five, please. One statistic doesn't tell the whole story, of course, but it does give us a, an overall insight into the situation. Uh, this slide shows Southeast Asian countries. We see Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam have already reached the 10% threshold. You can see the dramatic decline in unmet need in Cambodia during the current century. Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines and Myanmar appear likely that they might just miss getting unmet need down by 10% in the next 10 years, but like India, they are clearly within striking distance. Slide six, please. The picture in Eastern Asia is distinctive in that the three Asian tigers included in this slide, Taiwan, Hong Kong and South Korea, all had effective state-supported family planning programs up and running by 1970. And China introduced its modern program early in that decade too. There may be other aspects of SRHR that need improvement, but a further reduction in unmet need by 2030 in these countries is no longer a priority for them. It is still needed in Mongolia, however. And slide seven, for the Pacific Islands, as Noreen mentioned, we see countries with higher unmet need um, in 2020, still generally 20% or higher, and in the case of Samoa, close to 40%. So overall, these statistics for the Asia Pacific region confirm a lot of progress since 1970. And for some countries, universal access to family planning is effectively already here. Other countries, like several in Southeast Asia, seem on track to get very close to 10% by 2030. But their family planning and reproductive health programs probably need a dose of revitalization if they want to be confident of reaching universal access by 2030. While a third group of countries, especially in Southern Asia and the Pacific Islands, appear to need major reforms of policies and programs if they have a sincere commitment to provide universal access for their populations. So now let's look at the second indicator we mentioned, um, the maternal mortality ratio. Slide eight, please. This is a ratio, not a, not a percentage. It refers to the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 life births. And the numerator, uh, maternal mortality, refers to deaths resulting from causes relating to pregnancy or childbirth. The slide looks at the maternal mortality ratio in the same countries as before for a 25-year period, 1990 to 2015, when the SDG program uh, began. The data have been collected and collated by WHO, working with governments and a host of other UN agencies, and the y-axis is scaled from zero to 500 paternal deaths per 100,000 live births in each of the 28 countries. Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and New Zealand have the lowest MMRs, all showing a ratio of 15 or less for the last 20 years at least. Notice how in South Asia, Iran and Sri Lanka have since the 1990s joined the under 70 club. How in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam have reached MMR below 70 during the same period. Now in Eastern Asia, China and Mongolia have done the same. And in the Pacific, Fiji, which already had MMR just below 70 in 1990, has further halved its ratio during the 25 year period. And Samoa has joined the club of under 70. Southern Asia, has some of the highest MMRs. Afghanistan, Nepal, Maldives, Bangladesh, and India were also high in 1990. I would have to recalibrate the y-axis to include them in the graphs at that time. The MMR for Afghanistan is estimated to have been well over 1,000 in 1990. That is to say that there was one case or more of maternal death for every 100 live births. Out of the 28 countries shown, 12 still have MMRs of over 100, which implies the need for the introduction of significant new interventions. So the two indicators that we've looked at, unmet need for family planning and MMR, 
cannot give a comprehensive assessment of the current status of SRHR, but they do are, are sufficient to give an objective measure of the general status across countries in the region. And because these statistics are population-based indicators, they give an objective sense of the scale of the challenge in each country. It's clear from the scale of the challenges in several countries that it's not going to be enough just to try harder, but it will require new policies, new programs, new interventions, more service providers will be needed to be recruited and trained, new outreach programs developed, improved logistics for service delivery, new health infrastructure built and equipped and so forth. These activities in turn require or presuppose improvements in many other non-SPHR sectors, such as reducing poverty, better nutrition, expanding and improving education for all, especially children, girls, perhaps improved water and sanitation services, clean energy, etc. In other words, improving SRHR in isolation from all of these other developments is not an option. So it's time to answer the question raised at the beginning, what does SD, what does, what does sustainable development have to offer SRHR? And what can improved SRHR offer to sustainable development and to the climate change communities? Marlene referred to the idea of the being linking frameworks. I think there are two, two minutes. ways to approach this question. Both are important. Slide nine, please. One way is to think linearly in terms of causal connections. And this slide is an example, looking at the causal connections between climate change and population health. I've taken the diagram from the work of Anthony McMichael, a highly respected and much loved colleague who passed away in 2014, who was a pioneer in researching the links between climate change and population health, even before the IPCC was established. And he became a, a key figure in the IPCC uh, movements and assessments looking at this issue. On the left of the diagram, we have components of climate change, such as temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind patterns, and so forth. These components affect the natural environment, the second main column, producing extreme weather events, disruption of species, communities, and ecosystems, sea level rise, environmental degradations of land, rivers, oceans, as well as of the air that we breathe. And it's these changes brought about in the biosphere which impact the health of populations, either directly by stressing the human physiological organism itself, as Nolene mentioned, which is particularly crucial for sexual and reproductive health. Um, another example would be uh, heat, heat stress or the effects of the environmental changes can be indirect through impacts on other animals and plant species and ecosystems, for example, on bacteria or other microbes which can make us sick or on the mosquitoes which carry the malaria, parasite and so forth. Yet Time's another- up. Thanks, Adrian, sorry. Oh my God, really? Okay, um, just want to mention very briefly, I don't have two more minutes or not, no, sorry. I'm sorry, you didn't hear me. Yeah, uh, yes, but that's all right. Keep just just finish it up. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. An alternative approach is to look more holistically at this. So the point of this diagram is to look at the connection between SRHR on the one hand and climate change and sustainable development on the other, and look at the links in terms of the way population dynamics like changing age structures affect those linkages. And the last slide, please. Um, so just to summarize the holistic link, um, the focus of the holistic approach is more on looking for alliances and partnerships across sectors than causal connections. The commonality lies in the fact that the sectors, all sectors are struggling to come to terms with the same underlying population dynamics. So to conclude, all sectors are responsible for their own piece of the common vision of sustainable development. 
And we have argued that sustainable development is important for thinking about uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights and vice versa. So in closing, I want to stress that SRHR may appear to play a merely modest role in the SDGs, but improving SRHR is absolutely essential in realizing the vision of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hayes, and um, apologies for having to stop you on what was a fascinating um, um, presentation. Thank you. Um, we will uh, speak a little bit more about um, each uh, set of learnings that we've had at the end, but we'll move straight on now um, to look at a, a, a localized or national program. So, Talofalava uh, Leloa, we always hear that people can't speak, you know, work on any issue in the Pacific right now um, without focus on the climate crisis, and, and Pacific people have been leading globally in that work but maybe you can start by telling us a little about the CDCRM um, program and then move to you know showing some concrete linkages in the work between SRHR and climate change um, thanks a lot you have 15 minutes okay. Okay, let me put up my screen. And just while we're getting ready, can I just ask everyone if you're, uh, could you mute your microphones we're just hearing a lot of background noise so I'd really appreciate it thank you Thank you. Hello, good evening, Nisakula Binaka. Kia orana, maalo elile and talo falava everyone from Samoa. And uh, for those who haven't heard of Samoa before, so Samoa is a very beautiful small tropical island country that lies on the south of the equator and halfway between Hawaii and New Zealand in the Polynesian region of the Pacific Ocean. Samoa's primary humanitarian concern is the threat of natural disasters and the impact of climate change. Samoa's climate is characterized by high rainfall and humidity, winds dominated by the southeasterly trade winds and the occurrence of the tropical cyclones during the southern hemisphere summer. In 2009, my country experienced a devastating tsunami that caused catastrophic damage over 100 people lost their lives and more than 6,000 families lost their homes. In 2012, Samoa was hit by Cyclone Evan. This too caused a significant destruction to infrastructure. Other environmental events such as smaller cyclones and king tides regularly affect our small country and impact the health and well-being of our people. So why was CDCRM program established? After the devastation of the 2009 tsunami, our government recognized that we had been greatly underprepared to handle such an environmental disaster. And this is when the CDCRM program developed. The worst post tsunami scenario was that people struggled as they were drained physically, mentally, spiritually, and resource wise and there were not any immediate recovery actions to remedy the impacts on the people. So the Community Disaster and Climate Risk Management Program, or CDCRM, was initiated by our government in order to better prepare our communities to handle inevitable environmental disasters. What does the CDCRM entails is that a situational analysis was um, including a community wide household based survey was conducted to identify hazards and potential risks. Medication planning meeting followed to identify and prioritize measures to mitigate the risks. This was followed by a response planning meeting to formulate disaster response plan for the communities including early warning systems, evacuation routes, and safe zones identification, the selection of safe shelters and allocating 
roles for certain response team in times of disasters. The program also looked at developing village response teams by selecting response teams and training them in early warning, evacuation, first aid, search and rescue, shelter management, counseling, bodies management, WASH safety, security and safety, aid coordination and overall disaster coordination. Last but not the least is the conduction of a simulation activity or exercises in the community or in the villages based on the most devastating disaster that cyclone. So the CDCRM program is envisaged to cover all 361 villages of Samoa. The program allows the villages to establish village disaster response plans that are immediately activated whenever disaster strikes. Uh, for so far, we have covered and trained 82 villages out of the 361 villages in the country. The collaborating partners. So this program is led by the government through the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, Disaster Management Office, DMO, Adventist Development Relief Agency, the ADRA, and the Samoa Red Cross. They are the leading agencies of this program. Partnering, partnering with relevant ministries and non-governmental organizations to facilitate a program set to reach all villages of Samoa in climate resilience and disaster preparedness. Listed here are all the supporting partners involved in the CDCRM program, including the disability organization, NOLA, advocating for inclusion of people with disability and making sure that no one is left behind. Fata Waleola or FLO, or the psychological organization who played an important role in 2009 uh, post tsunami, providing mental support to people affected. So each agency listed here, they provide assistance specific to their field of mandated roles, including SPA, Samo Family Health Association, leading the provision of services around sexual reproductive health and rights. So how did we become part of this program? So with the support of our IPPF humanitarian program, Samo Family Health Association joined the SPRINT project in 2017. It's an Australian aided fund disaster preparedness, response and resilience project, which aims to raise the sexual and reproductive health in emergency capacity of countries particularly vulnerable to disasters. In April, 2017, Samo Family Health Association had the opportunity to be included in a high level review of Samoa's national disaster plan and successfully advocated for the inclusion of sexual reproductive health in response considerations. Combined with our joining the IPPF's PRINCE program the same year, SFAS work or Samo Family Health Association's work in advocating for sexual reproductive health and rights in emergency settings was catalyzed. SFA now has a multifaceted uh, approach to dealing with sexual reproductive health and rights needs in the face of climate change in Samoa. At a regional and national level, we advocate for the inclusion of sexual reproductive health and rights in policy and planning to ensure an enabling environment for our work. It can be sometimes be an overwhelmingly challenging task. We are often criticized for raising um, sexual reproductive health and rights issues in humanitarian considerations. But it is these challenges and changes in understanding and uh, perception of sexual reproductive health considerations in crisis that challenge us more to continue to advocate for our cause. Our communities will always first consider shelter, water and food when discussing humanitarian consideration, which is understandable but we must continue to advocate to broaden the scope of consideration. So through the National CDCRM program, SPA is able to empower women and girls in the community to be central actors to help and support the community in times of crisis. They are starting to look at sexual reproductive health and rights as one aspect to consider when a disaster occurs. Within the community, committees under the CDCRM program 
Samo Family Health Association is a part of a shelter committee to educate the community on ways to manage the evacuation center. So we work with the community leaders to offer information on how to care for a pregnant mother and a newborn baby, how to value and respect the needs of adolescents and young people in the evacuation center, um, to avoid and stop any forms of violence, and to encourage the community to be well prepared and use any resources they could get at the time before external help arrives. The work of Samo Family Health Association in the CDCRM program reiterates the importance of continually enhancing women's resilience and enabling policy level. So this CDCRM partnership has contributed towards this process and it has encouraged SPA, Samo Family Health Association, to enhance our institutional capacity with the finalization of our disaster risk management plan. So, although we have not yet been required to respond directly to, to a humanitarian crisis, however, we, have, we, have, we are heavily involved in all aspects of the preparedness and resilience efforts of our Samoan people, continuously looking for opportunities to localize humanitarian approaches in order for people to prepare and promote a healthier, a more resilient and cater for the need of women and girls in the community. Because we believe that humanitarian and development work is the future and that working together saves lives, offers value for money and a very sensible thing to do. Thank you. Thank you and for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lelo. Um, and well within time, you didn't even have your two minute. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that, you know, what's one of the things that I really related to in your presentation is about who's in the room and who's not in the room. And, and for those who are able to, um, it's great if, you know, we can bring in some of the, the, the constituencies and groups that may not be. So now we'll move to Dr. Safiya um, Ash, uh, Afshar from uh, Iran. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In the name of <clears throat> in the name of God, greeting to all. I'm Dr. Shahriyari, gynecologist, uh, founder member, and patron of Family Health Association of Iran. I am speaking from Tehran, the capital city of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, first of all, let me thank Secretariat of the Congress for giving me this opportunity to present my speech. That is about humanitarian assistance and providing needs in Golestan flood crisis by FHA Iran. In this slide, I give you some general information about Iran. The population of my country is about 83 million. Country area is about 1,648,000 square kilometer. Official language is Farsi and the capital city is Tehran. Uh, I want to introduce uh, very shortly my association. FHA Iran is a non-governmental, non-profit, non-political and voluntary based organization and pioneer NGO in the field of SRHR in the country and was established in 1995 and has official certificate from Ministry of Interior. We have three international position. Uh, FHA Iran is a full member association of International Planned Parenthood Federation and holder of the special consultative status from UN ECOSOC in health field since 2010 and also member of World Hepatitis Alliance. At the national level, we are a member of CCM, President of National HIV AIDS Network, exco member of National Rehabilitation Network and Iranian Non-Communicable Disease Alliance. He could receive Red Ribbon Award for a joint project from UN AIDS headquarters. Recently, Judiciary of Iran appointed patron of FHA Iran as chair of Health Working Group and IPPF Governing Council has awarded to patron of FHA Iran as the best volunteer contribution to SRHR in 2020. Uh, 
sorry. The mission of my association is promotion of SRHR, especially among the youth and women, by emphasizing on vulnerable groups such as sex workers, addicts, homelessness, refugees, prisoners, people living with HIV, children label, with consistence of religion, culture, and value of the society. We have six branches one mobile clinic and some outreach teams. Each month, 30,000 educational counseling and services of SRH and non-SRH have been provided to the clients by FHA Iran free of charge in the remote area. Now I start to introduce my um, real story about Golestan flood. The location of flood was Golestan province and the population in that time was 1,800,000 and the living area is more than 20,000 square kilometer. The language in this area is Farsi, Turkmen and Turkish and the center of this province is Borgan. The date of Golestan flood was 20 of March 2019. I would like to draw your attention to this point that in this natural disaster, 300 millimeter of rainfall occurred in two days which is equal to the average of one year's rainfall in Golestan province. This amount of rainfall in this area has been unprecedented throughout the period of meteorological data recording, at least for the past 70 years. In this slide, you see that unfortunately 60 1,000 people displaced, 40 people passed away, and 116 injured. And uh, we could implement the project with very excellent partnership and coordination with local, national, and international organization. At the international level, let me appreciate Interplan International Planned Parenthood Federation, especially IPPF South Asia Regional Office, for very kind technical and financial support of FHA Iran. And uh, after IPPF approved the project, we started negotiation at the national level with women and family deputy in presidency office and Iranian Red Crescent Society uh, for getting permission. And after receiving permission, we could implement the project with very nice cooperation with local organization, which were Golestan Welfare Organization, Health the Beauty of Medical and Science University, Golestan Governance, Golestan Red Crescent population and local NGOs. And other partners were private sectors and philanthropies. The private sectors were K Humboldt Company, Pars Hayan Company, Parsian Azadi Hotel. And I thank and appreciate all of our partners at local, national, and international level for very kind support of FHA Iran during the implementation of this project. Uh, we sent our mobile clinic to the Golestan province and we hired local staff who were one midwife, one medical doctor, one psychologist, uh, all of them were women and one driver. The number of remote villages that we covered was 24 and the duration of project was four months. Mobile clinic presence schedule was eight hours a day and five days a week. Uh, one of our activities that we have done in this project was prevention of violence in Golestan flood. And the activities that we have done were ensuring equality access to service of mobile clinic for everyone, especially women, girls, and children without any discrimination. Ensuring of presence of people among service providers who were familiar with the local language providing counseling services by women health providers in a security space and informing service providers about the importance of confidentiality of work and the code of conduct against sexual exploitation and harassment. And um, in other activities in this item were providing screening and violence prevention counseling for all the people, especially women, girls, adolescents and children referring people who need special intervention in the field of GBV and holding some workshops on prevention of violence for women and girls. Another, <laughs> another activity that we have done was prevention of maternal and neonatal mortality and morbidity in Golestan flood. Uh, 
And uh, the activities in this item were attending a trained midwife and general physician for providing SRH and non-SRH education, counseling, and services. Establishing a referral system for dispatching and communicating between the local community and the health center or hospital. Monitoring and evaluation, reporting, and documentation. The next activity that we have done was prevention of STD, HIV, and syndromic treatment of sexual transmitted diseases in Golestan flaw. And the activities that we have done uh, in this item were uh, providing VCT services, clinical examination, and syndromic treatment of STDs, group and individual education to people about HIV and other STDs, use a sterile disposable needle and syringe, condom promotion and distribution, uh, distribution of safety box to collect <coughs> the needle and syringe and other sharp objects. Next activity was preparation and distribution of health kits in Golestan flow, and uh, we could provide it to uh, 2,000 pieces of health kits and uh, we distributed among the people and in each health kit items were shampoo, soap, condom, toothbrush, toothpaste, sanitary napkin, burn ointment, women's health gel, combs and towel. The next activity that uh, we have done in this project is providing SRH and non-SRH services in Golestan Fla. And in the next slide, you see the total number of our services. I'm speaking about SRH and non-SRH services. The total number were 87,413 and the services were contraceptives, abortion, gynecology, HIV AIDS, obstetrics, pediatrics, STI, urology, specialized counseling, and non-SRH. And the next slide, you see the proportion of our services. Uh, for non-SRH was 55% and for SRH services was 45%. The number of clients who received SRH and non-SRH education, counseling and services were 1,751 with the following information. 95% of clients were women and only 5% were men. 87% were over 25 years old. 8.5% were 10 to 24 years old. And only 4.5% were children. 0.2% of clients were pregnant. Uh, in this slide, you can see the summary of our activities uh, that were providing and delivering high quality SRH and non-SRH services, educational screening and counseling of GBV, prevention of STD, HIV, and syndrome treatment of sexuality transmitted disease, providing and distributing 2,000 health kits, holding training class on health education and various SRH subjects distribution medicine free of charge. In the next slide, uh, I would like to share with you some challenges and achievements that we faced during implementation of our project in the Golestan flood. I would like to draw your attention to this point that unfortunately we faced too heavy and oppressive US sanction and the the target of sanction is the people of Iran. Due to this cruel sanction, we face some challenges, such as insufficient essential medicine for rare and special diseases, such as diabetes, cancer, thalassemia, MS, kidney disease, hepatitis, HIV, cardiovascular, and respiratory. Insufficient of medical equipment, such as HIV and hepatitis diagnostic key, and difficult to get funding from head office on time. All were due to sanctions. And another uh, challenge was that we didn't have outreach team and the short duration of the project. And the achievements that uh, we, I want to share with you uh, were in spite of Iranian New Year, Nowruz, and some of the staff from government and NGOs were in leave, but we could start and run the project with excellent partnership and coordination with local, national, and international organizations. Fundraising from local and national charities, philanthropies, private sector for the projects, 
having SRH strategic plan for crisis, having a quick referral system, a strong monitoring evaluation system and good documentation, provide high quality education, counseling and SRH and non-SRH service delivery for both sexes and all ages, including individuals. And uh, we uh, could sign off MOU with Iran Red Cross Society and with Department of Health in Accident and Disasters with the Tehran University of Medical Science, holding a reproductive health panel in crisis and presenting the lesson layers of Golestan flood by Family Health Association of Iran at the International Congress of Iranian Women and Midwifery on November 2019, and also holding Golestan flood photo exhibition at this Congress. That is my great honor. I could share all of our lesson layers of this project with you, my friends, in very valuable virtual meeting. And the next slide, I would like to present to you some beauty attractions of Iran. <laughs> and the last slide is, uh, this is the uh, poster of our photo exhibition of Golestan flood in crisis. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Afshar, and, and, and smack bang on time. So thank you for that as well. Um, just a wonderful presentation all around. And there's a lot in there about kind of uh, the, the ability for a program to deliver a comprehensive um, set of programs during, you know, a disaster risk and response um, and, and in an unprecedented event like that. And the range of education and uh, counseling and services that are provided. And also thank you for putting forward the issues around geopolitics and sanctions and some of those wider issues that we don't often um, speak about or get the chance to speak about. So thank you very much. Um, we'll you, now sir. be moving to um, Biplabi um, Shestra, who will be speaking about worth. But I just wanted to say to all of the speakers, please, if you can just keep an eye on the chat, because I, because I think there's some um, questions and comments that are already coming up um, for the presentation so far. So it'll help at the end if you've already had a look at them. Um, over to you, thanks, Biplabi. Thank you, Noelin, uh, and thanks to all who have joined us today for this very important conversation we are having through this session. Uh, before jumping into work, I just want to give an overview of Arrow and our work leading to work. I hope my screen is, I mean, you can see my screen and presentation. It's fine, thank you. Thank you. Let's just okay, I can't move, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, we are a regional NGO based in Malaysia and currently working um, with more than 80 national organizations in 17 countries in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, Arrow strives to enable women and young people to be equal citizens in all aspects of life by ensuring that their sexual and reproductive health and rights are achieved. And our advocacy work spans across the globe and we identify as a South-based feminist um, advocacy organization. Uh, so we, uh, we work towards this uh, vision using a very multi-pronged approach. Um, and like you know, uh, we do a monitoring and evaluation. We also mobilize communities for SRHR. And uh, we also build new constituencies for SRHR uh, because we also realize that, you know, if you want to deal with the issues of um, uh, SRHR, it can't be dealt with in isolation because there's so many other factors that are impacting uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, especially of women and young people. And we do a lot of information and communications for change work. And all of these lead to our advocacy work for policy adoption uh, change and implementations. Uh, so, um, so I also like you know, um, as presented in the previous uh, presented by the previous speakers, there is a very clear linkage between climate change and SHR, but it is often neglected. Um, it's been almost a decade since Arrow's work on this interlinkage, and uh, we started by building perspectives on this issue through our uh, flagship uh, publications, which is also known as Arrows for Change. And we also did uh, scoping studies in eight countries in Asia to generate evidence on this interlinkage. And the scoping studies are, are also crucial as they brought out the critical elements based on the country context. And this is how our scoping studies look like and you can also download it from our website. So, and these are some of the highlights from our studies that the Asia and the Pacific region is at the forefront of experiencing the impact of climate change. Um, and I just want to highlight here that we should already recognize it as a crisis. 
uh, that needs to be addressed immediately and through an intersectional approach because of like you know the different differential impacts that it has on different audience um so what our studies have shown and also what our speakers have already talked about is like um climate change affects everyone uh, but the impact of climate change is not gender neutral because of the pre-existing inequality uh, that are perpetuated by uh, patriarchal beliefs that are also and like you know that be that in the system be that in the political system social or economic and this inequality is exacerbated during the times of crisis and we are experiencing this in this uh, covid context as well yeah and so these are these are just a few examples this is not an exhaustive list there are just a few examples for example uh, and, and these are all coming out from our scoping studies where women are faced with added burden within their household uh, which leads to girls dropping out of school to help gather energy, food, and um, water needs of families. A uh, study from Bangladesh revealed that due to the same reason, women are also more vulnerable compared to their male counterparts. For example, even upon receiving early warning of cyclone, uh, women did not immediately seek refuge at um, cyclone shelters. Instead, they stayed back to uh, manage the household and to safeguard their assets and uh, livestock. Uh, this is also this is also exacerbated uh, child and early uh, age marriage uh, because this is being used as a coping strategy in many poor communities, and we have this highlighted in our studies from Bangladesh, Indonesia, Laos, and uh, Nepal. And this is despite the fact that child marriage is banned in some of these countries. So we see that there is a increased uh, gender-based violence within families. Women and girls are more exposed to sexual violence in camps for shelter. Uh, practices such as gender ascribed roles and household food hierarchy system uh, that are still in practice in our communities and also lacking decision-making power leads to food insecurity and malnutrition of women and girls that affects uh, throughout their life cycle. And this also prevents women and girls from accessing and utilizing healthcare services, especially for their sexual and reproductive health and rights. And as a result, we have seen in the first presentation, like, you know, there's a high maternal mortality rate. There are unwanted pregnancies because of unmet need of contraception and lack of access to safe abortion. And most of these viola violations of SRHI, if you see, these are systemic. Uh, it is perpetuated through policies and programs, and it is made even worse in times of crisis because SRHI is not incorporated into most countries' um, national climate change policies or like, you know, the national adaptation plans of action. And like, you know, this then perpetuates again the vicious cycle of inequality that women and girls suffer throughout their life cycle. And these are like, you know, in order to amplify the, the voices from the girl, we have captured the stories in various formats. And these are postcards which feature women in the front line of climate change. And we continue to use this as our um, um, evidence for our advocacy work. And so some of these gaps and challenges um, that we are facing as part of our work in order to ensure that, you know, SRHR is in the mainstream of the discussion. Um, the interlinkages between climate change and gender is established, at least rhetor rhetorically. Um, though SRHR in its comprehensive form is largely missing in all these, all these dis uh, discussions. So, um, so SRHR and gender we see at least in like, you know, uh, international agreements such as SDGs and Paris Agreement. However, none of these have accountability framework within them. And as advocates, we know that accountability framework is essential to ensure uh, that uh, states respect, protect, and fulfill their commitments to basic human rights, which get further violated in the times of crisis. Uh, women are made more invisible in environment and climate-related discourses. And if you have been to spaces like COP, like in, a, in a, any, any intergovernmental spaces, you see that you know, the spaces are so male-dominant, and, and it hardly re reflects uh, women's lived realities in, in decisions and negotiations. There is limited or no space for CSEs in decision making, and this is further shrinking in many advocacy spaces. Uh, we also recognize, we do recognize that, you know, there are um, multiple processes internationally and regionally on climate change and human rights, and they are linked to some level, but like, you know, uh, many of these mechanisms at the national level, especially, are not connected with each other. And the interlinkages between these mechanisms are not completely understood by CSO or, or the governments. Uh, we have gender responsive planning and implementation and budgeting, which is not taken into consideration when implementing programs related to climate change. Um, and 
the, the, the other thing that I really want to highlight is how we are facing having this like, you know, this dangerous narrative around population control. Uh, which is being used as a response to climate change. And some governments are identifying rapid demographic growth as impediment towards uh, sustainable development. And when it comes to population management, the higher burden is always placed on women, uh, leading to systemic violence of SRHR through population control policies, for example, forced sterilization, which completely disregards the SRHR of women. And this is despite the fact that there are evidences to show that the primary driver of climate change is the consumption pattern and not the high uh, fertility rate. So in order to address um, these challenges and in order to like, you know, uh, uh, ensure that, they're, they're, that we are raising the bar for SHR, especially in the context of climate crisis, um, uh, we have been doing a lot of advocacy work and our advocacy work um, adopts both traditional and innovative approach. In the first approach, we identify decision-making spaces such as um, those facilitated by uh, UNFCCC and also we are, I mean like, you know, we are also part of um, women's rights groups such as women and gender constituent constituency to push the SRHI agenda, which is crucial for sustainable solutions. And more recently, we are uh, exploring innovative way of doing our work and on this interlinkages. So uh, in our effort to be innovative, um, Women and Earth Initiative, also known as WORTH, was launched in 2018. So WORTH Initiative as an innovative program is created to build the capacity of environmental or climate change civil society actors on the nexus between climate change and researcher. Um, hence, it is branded as innovative ideas for equitable and sustainable change because business as usual is inadequate to meet the challenges of today and their consequences. Um, so yes, work is an innovative program and fun and um, we, where we have created a platform to unleash creativity and develop new integrated solutions to gender equality, um, SRHR and climate change. And um, this initiative aims to address these three issues on SRHR. One is lack of knowledge on the nexus between SRHR and climate change. Um, second is lack of civil society capacity to innovate the world for these interlinkages to be translated into policies and practices. And the third is the lack of civil society on funding uh, to realize advocacy work. And uh, the overall purpose is that uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights are respected, protected and fulfilled as an end goal in itself and as a fundamental means to um, achieve gender equality, human well-being and environmental sustainability. But we also um, uh, try to bridge the silo that um, that exists uh, between our efforts. For example, like you know, the uh, the work of SRHR and the work of climate change. We uh, try to bring that together through this um, uh, through this initiative. Um, there are two components uh, to this program. Uh, first is an innovation lab that is attended by about ten to twelve candidates who are screened and selected through open call process. And the aim of this lab is to raise awareness on the nexus and also to strengthen the capacity of the participants on how to develop and implement innovative ideas. So this lab consists of two physical workshops and one online uh, course module, which together form a comprehensive capacity development setup. And there is a gap of a month in between the two workshops to pilot the ideas that were formed in uh, first workshop. And this year we had to take the entire lab to a virtual space because of the um, uh, travel bans uh, due to the COVID. Um, so the second component is the civil society based funding mechanism and as part of this the worth initiative has established a uh, worth initiative fund uh, which provides a number of small grants for lab participants with the best ideas. So the purpose of these grants are to give the participants the opportunity to give life to their ideas and test them in real life. So only those who have participated in and completed the Worth Innovation Lab program are eligible to apply for this funding. Um, currently, uh, we are focused as uh, part of this initiative, we are focused on four uh, countries who are experiencing extreme climate um, related events in the region and they are Myanmar, Bangladesh, Pakistan and the Philippines. And um, yeah, so Arrow and its Arrow and Danish Family Planning Association they came together to form this initiative. And we also have uh, this various other committees in decision making and implementation processes. 
So in the first cohort, um, uh, we, uh, World Initiative uh, funding was able to provide uh, support, funding support uh, for the implementation of four innovative ideas. And they are from the Philippines and Pakistan. And all these ideas were pitched um, that uh, like based on the community, their work in the community, and it, they target a wide range of audience. So this is the um, first program, Media Most for Women and Israel in Climate Change. It is implemented in Pakistan by our grantee, uh, Samreen, um, um, Samreen Khan Gauri. Uh, it focuses on improving media advocacy among journalists and media outlets to generate evidence for advocacy to policymakers on climate change and SRHR. Um, this is our Two second minutes, idea. Two minutes, thanks, Bipla. Sure, I'm just almost done. Um, SRHR and Environmental Defenders Flight for Climate Change Resilient Healthcare Project in the Philippines, which is implemented by our grantee paths. It focuses on the traveling road show where um, SIHR and climate champions, including doctors, uh, travel across selected villages to raise awareness by talking about the interlinkages of SIHR and climate change. And this is Cookie Jar for SIHR uh, that is also implemented in the Philippines. It focuses on utilizing the local government's gender and development fund for SIHR and climate change. And it also enables a photo gallery sh showcasing women from disaster areas and their stories, which will be used as an advocacy tool. And unfortunately, our fourth idea is yet to take off due to the COVID. And currently, we are in the process of Process, in the process of finalizing our grantees for the second round, and we're also finalizing candidates for our third round of lab. And we're very excited to um, launch our grantees soon. So I'll stop here, but like, you know, um, you can also um, keep yourself updated on our activities and also on, on this interlinkages the, uh, between climate change and disaster through work Twitter as well as um, the website. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pip Labi, and a really interesting um, for many reasons, but also like what states will and won't work on and, and how there you know, needs to be the work to specifically to change that. And uh, um, really looking at what is the just gender responsive and transformative approaches that are required. What are the feminist work that we can do on, and you mentioned care burden and early marriages and GBV and SV in camps and others. And the last one maybe a takeaway for me is also keeping in the top of mind these issues issues around population control narratives. We worked so hard as women's movements and feminists um, over decades um, on moving away from these Malthusian frames of, of work and it is rearing its head again. So it's a problem that we have to think through. I think there's a question in the chat box about that for later, um, if you could look at that. Um, and just on the importance of social movements um, and groups like the Women and Gender Constituency on UNFCCC and others. So thank you for that. Um, now we've got a chance to to examine um, in a summary, but in a really helpful way, some linked work. So a tri-country study um, from Cambodia, India, and Pakistan. So thank you. Just um, as we said, you have limited time, and uh, we want you to have the time, take the time, five minutes each, Ashish, Dr. Ziba, and then Dr. Bidu um, Bushan. Thank you very much. And this will close our speaker session. Thank you, Noreen. Uh, we do indeed have a challenge because we have <laughs> lots of uh, lots to share. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here. Uh, essentially, these will be snapshots of the three studies that we conducted in uh, Cambodia, India, and Pakistan under the Population Council's Population Environmental Risks and Climate Change Initiative called PERC. We can share more information about that as we, um, as we move forward. The first study I will present will be on Cambodia, looking at a major flood event in Cambodia and how it affected uh, maternal health and family planning service uptake. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors while I do that. Um, as most of us know, Cambodia is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in, in Asia and flooding has been a perennial problem in Cambodia. It's been frequent and it's been a severe hazard, but over the last uh, decade or so, flooding has be become more severe. And there was a major event in 2013, a major flooding event that we're utilizing in this study to look at how it affected uh, maternal health services as well as family planning services. As we began this study, we be, uh, began looking at the literature on SRH and maternal health and family planning and its relationship with climate disasters. And we found that the literature was not as strong as we thought it would be uh, uh, compared to, for example, uh, the relationship between floods and vector-borne diseases, which has a strong literature. So we wanted to add to this 
literature by asking the questions around whether floods affect maternal health and family planning service uptake, and if they do, what mechanisms they follow. Um, the major uh, flood event in 2013 was a result of heavy rainfall in September, uh, which caused flooding in 20 out of the 24 provinces in Cambodia. As you can see on this map, the red denotes the flooded areas throughout the northwest and along the Mekong River, affecting nearly 2 million people. 144,000 people were evacuated uh, and an estimated $350 million plus of damages. Um, we took this disaster and we utilized the Cambodian Demographic and Health Surveys of 2010 and 2014 to create this um, natural experiment framework where the 2010 uh, survey acted as the pre-flood or baseline data and the 2014 survey we made sure that the, all the data were collected after the September 2013 event acted as the end line data. Um, the intervention variable or the treatment variable as we would call it in the framework was flooding and we took the OCHA humanitarian data exchange data to look at flooding extents. If uh, a particular cluster in Cambodia fell within a flooded area, we called it a uh, uh, we called it flooded, and whether if it didn't fall, fall within a flooded uh, area extent, uh, it was as non-flood affected. And we merged these data sets with the DHS and examined outcomes, traditional outcomes that we look at uh, for MNCH, including delivery at the facility, uh, uptake of four or more uh, ANC services, as well as the uptake of modern contraceptives. We applied a method called the difference in difference approach. We took the changes between 2000 and 10 and 2014 in the flood affected areas. And we subtracted the changes in the same time period in non-flooded areas from it to look at the impact of what happened. Because we have limited time, I won't go through each of these numbers in detail, but as you can see, we looked at the, the key outcomes, specific outcomes on the left-hand side. And this is from the pre-flood time. We had uh, data for both intervention and control areas. We also had the same data for the post-flood time. Uh, for intervention and uh, uh, control areas. And then we took the differences, as I mentioned. And on the far right-hand side, the, the uh, column labeled DID value, that is essentially the difference between whether an intervention area was affected more than the control area. A negative value on that column would indicate that the intervention area was affected more negatively. As you can see, we only found one indicator that has a magnitude that's negative. But we saw no statistically significant results in any of these results. We put it through a more rigorous test through a, a, a regression framework method, uh, applying confounding variables and still found, as you can see the blue row at the bottom, no statistically significant effects. Now this is just a preliminary uh, finding from what we found, but these results do suggest that the flooded, floods in Cambodia did not affect uh, the, uh, the uptake of maternal health services as well as family planning. Now, what, why could that be? I think we do need to Under do one more minute, detailed. Thank you. Uh, we have to do more detailed qualitative studies to understand this, but speculatively, we think that perhaps uh, flooding in Cambodia is endemic. Uh, there is a lot of resilience learned over experience over hundreds of years. And in particular, uh, maternal health uh, service seeking might be a particularly inelastic behavior uh, to shocks. Uh, you know, this is a very significant life, life event and people might not compromise on it. Uh, so we think that these might be issues. So we will do more studies around health system resilience and adaptation to understand this issue better. I will now move uh, this presentation to Dr. Zeba from Pakistan. Um. Thank you very much, Ashish. Thank you, Nolene. Thank you, all the organizers, for including um, you know, our presentations on three countries. Um, uh, if I can have the next slide. Um, just as in the case of Cambodia, uh, Pakistan has been experiencing uh, floods, but perhaps uh, never a flood like the 2010, um, which we can regard as an extreme event. Uh, floods have followed, but in the 2010 event, uh, it was more than 20 million uh, people were displaced and affected. Sorry, not displaced, affected, many displaced. There were huge economic losses, um, up to 16 billion is what is estimated. And as you can see, the flooding took uh, place across the country, starting from the northern point of the Indus River, KP, 
right down to Sindh. And uh, we chose to study the middle point, Miawali district, in more detail. It's one of the 29 out of the 136 districts that was most severely affected. Next, please. Next, yeah, thank you. Uh, so our uh, idea was to really, you know, if I can go back to the first, yeah, uh, to look at Miawali like a case study as part of our PERC program that Ashish mentioned. It's one of the earliest studies we did. We've now got a much better handle of how to merge, uh, use uh, demographic, geospatial data to really study the issue of um, vulnerability and resilience uh, to long-term uh, effects of environmental uh, factors and more acute ones of uh, climate change, acute shocks such as the 2010 uh, floods. Both are equally important. And I just want to point out that we have moved from studying issues of mitigation uh, rather than, and we've been looking more at uh, factors that can really contribute to reducing vulnerability and resilience amongst poor and poor populations, and especially amongst women and children. So that was the idea. And the approach was very, very, um, you know, to use whatever data be opportunistic. So next, um, just like um, uh, Ashish mentioned, next slide, please. Uh, we took this opportunity of looking at Miawali. We looked, it was pretty much a random choice because it was divisible into three sub-districts. And we could see Isa Khail is one of the Tehsils, a sub-district which was more affected, um, you know, the major, the major part of the brunt of uh, what happened in the flood happened there, whereas the other two sub-districts, Miawali and Pipla, were not as affected, and therefore it provided a kind of natural experiment. Next, please. Um, I want to start by saying, I mean, really, there isn't enough time to go into the details, but I would say that one of the most important things uh, that happens, as could be expected, are really the econ that a severe climate um, uh, event is a severe economic shock to the household. And this slide depicts that in the province of Punjab, during the floods, you hardly see any change in ownership of agricultural land. But if you focus on the tehsil of interest, Isakhail most affected, there was an 8% decline in uh, ownership of agriculture. So people sold uh, agricultural land within a period of three years. The period we are comparing is 2008 and 2011. This is statistically significantly different uh, across the tehsils. Uh, uh, we, don't, we haven't shown the data, but there was huge uh, sale of livestock as well. So households experience this economic shock, which could be all negative, but fortunately we found that it led to a kind of change, uh, next please, in the household dynamic. Um, in search of, uh, you know, um, I would say livelihood and earnings uh, in lieu of loss of agricultural uh, produce, basically the agricultural land was swept away at least for a couple of months. They really couldn't rely on uh, crops and so on. Um, income from that. So people either moved away, they, they uh, as you can see in this graph, they relied heavily on remittances and on uh, some, they did also experience, uh, receive a lot in social safety nets. There was a lot of uh, humanitarian assistance at that particular point. So um, things changed radically for households. And next we found to our surprise, um, that there were changes in household structure. For instance, again, focusing on Isa Khail Tehsil, you see a decline in the number, half uh, a child on average uh, decline. And overall, uh, more than one person uh, household size change in a period of just three years. So Isa Khail, um, things happen there. Mainly these are huge demographic processes um, perhaps a combination of displacement and migration, maybe even um, as we conjure the picture together, connect the dots, uh, also some changes, profound, more profound changes in household uh, fertility norms. And um, subsequent slide, uh, can we move on? Uh, um, sorry, uh, we're just out of time now. Um, okay. Could so, you just um, maybe finish off now? Yeah, okay, so uh, huge changes in gender, but let's get to the next slide, which is perhaps of greatest interest. Yeah, 
So reproductive health indicators improved, and this is the surprise finding. Um, there is uh, almost like, uh, there is huge unmet need in Miawali, but a rise of uh, contraceptive use from 26 to 41. This is very different for the rest of Punjab. And we can see that this is pretty much pervasive across Punjab in the right-hand side bar. We can see the severely affected districts are, uh, do experience positive. And we think it's a combination of services displacement uh, and a lot of underlying social change. So I'll, I'll, I'll give up my time because I think we should move on to my colleague Bidu. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jawa. Um, so uh, I will be uh, talking about a paper that is going to publish in BMJ for uh, Global Health in next week or so. Uh, so, as you all know, air pollution is one of the biggest public health concerns and uh, India is globally recognized as a country that has uh, been affected most by the air quality. And the problem is that each year this uh, problem is going to be uh, increasing every year with more urbanization and uh, industrialization happening in smaller second and third tier cities. So, um, everyone knows that air pollution affects child health, but what is new that we are going to talk about in this paper? So what has happened, the, all the previous evidences that we reviewed or anything, either they have relied on uh, transformed air pollution data or mostly on the satellite-based air pollution data to do the analysis. Second thing is that when they do the uh, check the relationship between air pollution and um, child health, they somehow ignore the facts, uh, other important covariates like hygiene of the household, hygiene practices of the household or the socioeconomic status of the household. So we, in this paper particularly, we are going to see how it affects uh, confounding or effect modifier while studying the effect of air pollution. So we uh, use two task forces for air pollution. We took the raw air pollution data provided by the Central Pollution Control Board. And for child health in the outcomes, we use the Indian Demographic Health Survey data. Next slide. And uh, after removing everything, we arrived at, uh, we could uh, kept only around 25,000 uh, sample size uh, of all the child that had been uh, asked these questions. So uh, first we uh, examined what is the confounding effect. Uh, is there any confounding effect of hygiene on air pollution and child health relationship? Uh, if you look at all this model, model one and model two, model two, uh, model one is only where the model includes only the measure of PM10. Uh, adjusted for other socio-demographic or the bath characteristic and model to include hygiene additionally. So this clearly shows that uh, at the point estimates you can compare, they lie very closely to each other, which suggests that there is no confounding effect of hygiene. Next slide, please. Similarly, we now uh, look for the uh, whether there is an effect modification uh, introduced by the hygiene. For this, what we did, we did a stratified analysis by poor hygiene and good hygiene household. And again, if you look at the confidence interval, they overlap across all indicators, which suggests that there are no effect modification. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, last year, Government of India launched the National Clean Air Program, and we, we uh, took an interest to see whether the effect of air pollution differs by uh, cities where there is NCAP program is going on, where then there is no program. And we see the uh, PM10 effect is almost uh, uniform, whether it is NCAP cities or non-NCAP city. Thank you. Next slide. So in summary, what we found is that uh, the ambient air pollution or the PM10 that we see, it affects child health. And it's a bigger predictor compared to hygiene or anything. As it, uh, there is no effect modification or this one. Also, what it suggested in the long term, you need more structural and behavioral intervention to change the practices. Uh, please note that these analyses were limited to urban areas. So the issues like, you know, vehicular pollution checks, uh, US double burning, which is affected by uh, neighboring states from Punjab, Delhi and other uh, states, they have to be more behavioral intervention to change the traditional practices. Along with uh, that, what I can say that the National Clean Air Program is a very good start by the government of India. However, uh, the efforts should be extended to towns which are not also part of the NCPF, uh, particularly to towns where the industry, industrialization and urbanization are progressing very fast. 
and finally the concluding thing is that improved emphasis on reducing both indoor and outdoor pollution is critical to improving the child health along with other factors like the hygiene and uh, other determinants of child health outcomes thank you thank you very much Cannot hear you, Noelin. I hope others are other individuals. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, so that probably is a, a cue for me, which is um, just to thank all of the speakers um, for, you know, both the resonances that we see across um, all of these um, country studies, but also the differences. Um, and the, the last thing I would say is what we know, both from COVID-19 and we know from climate change, is that, you know, we're waking up to the impacts and the effects of our bodies on the way that we negotiate power and how we retain um, autonomy and integrity of our bodies while we're dealing with the state and non-state actors and ourselves um, very intimately. So I just wanted to say thank you for a very fascinating um, session. And some of these study results are, are um, very surprising as well, we find. And that's part of this work together is kind of working out where the deeper, long and sustained work is. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Shobna, who's going to take you through the question and answer session but thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Noelin. Thank you very much for such an excellent chairing of the entire session. And now we have the Q&A session. We already have a lot many questions which have poured in. And so we will take up as many as time permits, although we have already overshot, I think, the time. Uh, we have a question for our plenary speaker, Dr. Hayes. And this question is from Varuni from Thailand. Uh, she says, uh, thanks for such an enriching and insightful plenary. Uh, Dr. Hayes, do you think that in the UN SDGs process, before its ad adoption in 2015 at UN General Assembly, the last R of SA SRHR was left out? That is, the rights was less, less addressed, perhaps, than sexual and reproductive health aspect. Do you feel so? And is rights-based approach and access to RH SRH is critical for all SDGs. Dr. Hayes. Right. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes. Um, I think the second R is uh, undervalued and underarticulated and not totally clear and so forth. I think the human rights are extremely important and it's valuable to hold on to that. And that I think is the vital point to hold on to in the sense that these rights are part of the vision for sustainable development. It's true that sexual and reproductive health is also causally connected to a lot of other things. And you could argue that it's actually instrumental to improving the health and the education and so forth of the population. And those arguments are true. But the fundamental argument is that you cannot have this vision of improved well-being and happiness without having these rights realized. And that's the fundamental argument. It's not negotiable. It's inalienable from that vision. And so I think that's the basic argument. Why, why it's undervalued, uh, this concept of rights, is simply very politically um, still contested. And so it's difficult to... Uh, we, we've got a lot of work to do to um, maintain the vision and explain it time and time again and try and clarify the narrative. One of the problems seems to be that the overall narrative about sexual uh, and reproductive health and rights, it's quite a complicated package uh, and it's hard to see where the limits are and so forth and it sort of has a number of prickly topics to it which will which some people will find hard to digest and so forth. So it's hard to keep a, a very lucid narrative about promoting SRHR, uh, I think. And so that's part, of, I'm not sure if I've answered the question, but I think that's part of the issue. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tasnia Ahmed, uh, who's program officer at Serac, Bangladesh. Um, 
Tasnia wants to know that the young women living in coastal or disaster prone areas often have to migrate to urban slums where they become more vulnerable and deprived. They are victims of climate change. Are there any specific programs to cater to their SRH needs? And what more needs to be done for them? Uh, Noeline, would you like to say something on that? Um, just very briefly, what I would say is we, what we know now from the work um, nine years on from starting at Diva for Equality is that those, those relationships that we build with um, young women particularly and, and of any sexual orientation and gender identity, whatever it is, um, are very important because of this. It's not just about the movement that comes from um, climate change and disasters, but it's also um, issues like having to leave home because of violence, sexual and gender-based violence, um, not being accepted because because of your sexual orientation and gender identity. So as they're transient, as they're staying in informal settlements and safe houses, there is a need for these relationships of care, an ecosystem of care that gets built. So the second thing I would say is we have nine hubs around the country where we have um, LBT um, young people who get together on a regular basis. And that's part of this. We can have young women who are doing the same thing, but it needs to be explicit and built into our structures and, and the ways in which we work with young, uh, young people and particularly with at-risk and marginalized young people for whatever reason. Thank you. Thank you. Ashish, would you like to add something to that? Sure. Um, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that is often neglected, I think in the case of Bangladesh or in Cambodia, is that uh, there isn't a very great understanding. There, there are anecdotes about why women migrate into the urban slums, and there are lots of programs in the urban slums that look at their SRHR, but a better understanding of the consequences or the circumstances of their migration due to climate uh, would be very useful in sort of uh, developing better programs that cater to the needs of, of these women who have uh, unique circumstances that have led them to migrate. And I think it's true for uh, most climate vulnerable countries. The, uh, the rural to urban migration often results into uh, slum dwelling and, you know, in, informal settlements. And we simply don't know enough about the, the circumstances of their migration. So, so I'll end there. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Leloa from Tahare, from Pacific Youth Council. And Tahare says that SRHR has come across as a taboo and sensitive matter in many Pacific communities. Uh, how have they been able to overcome some of the cultural barriers uh, or to deliver on SRH? And she has another question that the global community could learn a lot from the indigenous knowledge from our Pacific communities but there is a lack of emphasis on indigenous knowledge. So do the programs have a focus on this indigenous knowledge and how have you incorporated them in your program, especially in making linkages between climate crisis and SRHR? So would Leloa address this and then we can go to other speakers also if they want to address uh, this question. Yes, Leila, would you like to answer? It was, it was addressed to her. Hi. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I'm trying to reconnect to my um, computer. Um, yes, um, thank you to Hera for raising that um, concern. And um, yes, I believe that um, sexual reproductive health and rights is such a sensitive um, topic in our communities and some of our Pacific Island countries because of our cultural values. Um, so um, how we try to overcome these matters or these barriers is that um, we work alongside with the Ministry of Health and other uh, government ministries who supports um, sexual reproductive health and the work that some family health do for, um, for our communities. So. Um, what we have, um, what we have been trying to to do awareness on, is for people to understand that this is also um, a very important part of our health. Uh, is our sexual reproductive health? Uh, I, I also have my my executive director here who wants to um, add on to Tahiri's, um wants to, to to help Tahiri with her question, and I think she wants to. Um, to come up on. Yes. Um, yes. Welcome. Yes.
Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, very, very clearly. Yes. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, good evening uh, from Samoa, everyone. My name is VICT. I'm the executive director here for Samoa Family Health Association. And I'd like to add on to uh, what the law was trying to explain on the for Tahiri. Uh, like she said that we agree that uh, SRHR continues to be a very sensitive issue and um, each country has their own uh, unique way of doing things. In Samoa we do it our own way. So overcoming cultural barriers, though it continues to be a challenge when delivering SRHR services, uh, we have, uh, like the law will say, we collaborate with the ministries uh, like the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Environment in trying to overcome these barriers. How do we do that? We have adapted the, WHO, the World Health Organization module called the PIN, Package of Essential Services for NCDs. And uh, our Ministry of Health have contextualized that module to become the pain for Samoa or the pain the Samoan way. In that module, it, uh, it uh, entails, it entails the village protocol in which dialogue of any issue is very important. And the dialogues are uh, are uh, conducted in such a way that people feel that they own something. So in that way, we, we, go, we, we use that module to give them the ownership to discuss and decide on what's best for them. In the language, the Samoan language in trying to uh, translate the technical terms of SRHR is a challenge. But we have ways of uh, putting things in a, in simple language that people would understand and based on which audience that we talk to. Education of our people is very important and so we need to be very cautious on how we we speak on the language that we use so that it's culturally sensitive and that we appreciate the religious values and cultural values in Samoa. Doing it that way, feel people, uh, I mean, people feel um, a sense of belonging and they feel inspired to do more for themselves. All we do is go out there in a team. We don't go by ourselves. We go with all our partners. We take everything as one package so that people will hear from everyone and they will find out themselves the link, the link between SRHR and in crisis. I hope that explains. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you've really emphasized upon the rights-based attitude of dealing with the situation. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Shahriyari from Lulu Tian. Uh, Lulu says that in your final slides, you noted that one of the many accomplishments was strong <laughs> monitoring and evaluation, MNE. Could you please yes. elaborate a little bit more on the role of M and E in your project? Uh, yes, thank you so much for your question. Uh, every client uh, in our project, every client had a private file and the data of all the SRH and non-SRH services with the history of personal information such as age, gender, married status, sex, the number of children, and so on, sent to central office everyone. The second point was we could gather data weekly, monthly, and full report from the local staff. And the third one was the attendance of central office staff and CEO for monitoring the project in the affected area. And uh, the more important uh, points was we had brainstorming room in central office before starting the project, during implementation and after finishing. And we received the, uh, when we received the challenges of the uh, local staff, we regularly reviewed the challenges and we tried to find solution 
and uh, we shared our advices to local staff for uh, implementing uh, and running the project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from, yes, somebody wanted to add to it? That's, because that was a question directed to her only, I think. A question from Hen Min uh, wants to know about the impact of population control on SRHR and the global climate change. Does gender play any role in climate change and change, and is there any data related to it? Piplabi, would you like to say something on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so bodily autonomy and integrity is the core of sexual and reproductive health and rights, and they are completely um, ignored. They are neglected, and also like you know are threatened in the efforts that are guided by population control narrative because. It leads to uh, this population management efforts um, that places higher burden on women for solutions to climate change. Um, it also leads to policies and programs that doesn't take into account human rights of um, of women. And like you know, if there's SRHR uh, where it, it, it doesn't take into account that you know women uh, can choose if when and how many children they want to have. It's there's no there's no consultation. There's no consideration there their consent is not even uh, taken into account. So we do, of course, need to focus. We do, of course, need to focus on um, on, um, on unmet need of contraceptions. We do need to focus on like, you know, access to safe abortions, but it has to be entirely, put, it has to put women at the center of this decision. So like, you know, population uh, narrative control and population management efforts do not take this into account. So that's one aspect, but I also want to like, you know, say that, Focusing also on population control narratives or management uh, programs, it deviates us from the real problem, which is the consumption pattern. Like you know, and if if we are focused on this, focused on if we are not focused on the real problem, we are not finding the real solutions. Yeah. And yes, there are many studies that shows the interlinkages between gender and SHR, and I think there are there have been many that are presented at this panel as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from Min, and I think an interesting one about the, the impact on menstrual hygiene and also of, on, of women and also on the number of miscarriages that result during flooding periods, during a climate uh, cli disaster like the flooding. Uh, do the numbers increase or remain the same or uh, how does it affect these two? Uh, it's open to all the panelists, any of them of you can please answer this or deal with this. Regarding menstrual hygiene and miscarriages, do they increase during uh, calamity like flooding? Let me briefly comment yes, on yes. Uh, our study, and I think Dr. Zeva might have some insights on this as well. You know, our, the, the way we did our study was to, because of the lack of data that sort of connects climate uh, events and sexual and reproductive health, we had to sort of take this uh, unique approach of uh, combining two different kinds of data sets. We used GIS data sets for the floods and the DHS uh, for the SRHR indicators. And I just looked through the questionnaire and we unfortunately don't have indicators on menstrual hygiene in the DHS, for instance. So that goes to sort of, I think, pointing out that we do need to do more intentional studies related to climate change and SRHR. And in, in the plans that, you know, in our PERC initiative, we are exploring these issues further in different countries. Dr. Zeba, would you like to say something about what this finding might mean or what could be expected? Yes, I think you uh, asked that question and it takes us really to what's missing in our analysis and we plan to do and COVID has kind of prevented it, is really going and asking women themselves whether they experienced uh, these changes. Um, DHS, et cetera, won't provide that information, but I do want to uh, take this opportunity to say something about unmet need. Um, I think that the, the process that happens, and it's not uh, specific to uh, floods, it happened in the case of internet, uh, internally displaced uh, populations uh, when there was conflict in the north of Pakistan, um, that suddenly women are kind of, uh, it's a, an artificially created situation where they have faced new set of services, new information, um, you know, and perhaps have greater mobility. I mean, it comes with costs such as gender-based violence, etc. But I think what we saw in Miawali, and there was a question uh, that there was huge unmet need, and suddenly these women 
were able to access services. So I think it's a combination, uh, you know, um, there is a change and there's an opportunity and can go in the positive and the negative. I just want to say about menstrual hygiene, menstrual hygiene and all issues related to hygiene really connect with household conditions. Um, and I think that we can capture pretty well. It's behaviors, whether it goes up or down, but you know pretty well what the situation is um, because of household living conditions, such as sanitation, et cetera. And I do want to underscore what Adrian said. You can't just improve things in isolation. I think it's the whole package that we have to address. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, we have another question for Dr. Zeba. Uh, and uh, you said that reproductive health use of contraception improved uh, 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 during the floods. And yeah. this, is, this is very positive news and contrary to what is normally believed. Uh, so uh, could you say a bit more on potential mechanisms that may have led to the increase in usage of contraceptives in flood affected districts? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, uh, I try to address that actually, that uh, where there is unmet need and unmet need is high in Pakistan, uh, Adrian showed that. Um, and it's really, we are arguing and arguing that it's really supply that's falling behind. Now, there was a very high level emergency response in the time of floods, um, you know, and combined with all the UN agencies and NGOs, etc. And the, the package that UNFPA delivers is, is, was really delivered quite well um, in settings such as Miawali. And I think women took, took you know, really uh, soaked that up and really uh, did use those because I didn't show the slide, but institutional deliveries went up as well because services did improve from the very bad conditions that they must have been in earlier. So the process is really, um, I think the underlying theory is that it's a supply side issue. Uh, it's very much related to poverty, gender issues, but artificially a situation can occur and unmet needs can be met. Um, so I think something that we should be doing regularly, really looking at the rights of women, um, can happen in circumstances, but we have to maintain it. It has to be longer term, all those, uh, you know, of course, considerations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And let us not wait for floods uh, to up our services, but uh, continue during the so-called exactly. normal times. Exactly. Although Shoba, time if I, yes, if I may quickly comment yes. as well. Yes. I think there's something also to be said about sort of uh, understanding baselines. What, the, what were the conditions uh, mm -hmm. prior to the floods in each, each situation? And if, if the floods are uh, resulting in humanitarian assistance and better, uh, better services, that might, I mean, that might be the case in Pakistan where uh, the services improved and the uptake improved. But if, if a particular uh, area that was struck by a disaster was initially doing very well and they had very well services that it causes a major disruption in services that might actually act in the negative direction. Um, in, in Cambodia, the, the non effects that we saw, I think is, is sort of somewhere in the middle where, you know, the services did not really show any change and, and as a result of, of resilience that I spoke about. So I, I think uh, an understanding of the baseline would, would be uh, better to, to put this into context. Yes, and, and let us hope the services keep on continuing and uh, means, uh, improving also during, during the so-called normal times. And I, as I said, uh, times are never actually normal for women. This is what I feel. They are always abnormal in some way or the other. Now, okay, now we've got too many thank you messages on the chat box for all the presenters. So it's very difficult to read them one after the other, but uh, there are a lot of accolades for all of you. So we come to the close of this fifth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual and my sincere thanks to the chairperson Noeline and the plenary speaker, all the abstract presenters and to the, for the participants also for their active involvement in it. We will now meet again on 31st August, which will be a Monday and we will be meeting at 1 p.m. Cambodia time for the sixth APCR SHR 10 virtual session on the theme of innovative financing for SRHR in Asia Pacific. Now buy till then and stay safe, stay healthy and stay tuned. Goodbye. Thank you, Sharpa. Thank you, Sharpa and Bobby. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.